I'm Joe Bracken. And I'm Dan McDuffie. Yeah, it's another edition of Tech Points. Yeah. It's an interesting one. Yeah, we've got... Uh, Joe's going to start here. Yeah, I'm going to start off with just a uh, uh, one of our uh, good camera camera guys here, one of the folks that help us with the show. Our, uh, he had a question about uh, getting an iPod um, video onto his iPod. Uh, has an iPod just like uh, you and I both do. Um, it's black iPod here. Um, iPod video... Um, it's you can always. I mean, we've been. I mean, we talked about buying music on the music store. We talked about buying uh, um, TV shows and movies and things like that. Uh, but you know, often it, you want to rip your own videos, and uh, that's one of the things that he wanted to do. Um, real quick, I've got a couple websites here. Let me pop these up on the screen. But um, in order to encode video for this uh, iPod video, you need to encode it in, uh, into a special format. Um, it's called, um, it's a format called H264. Uh, I better say that correctly before. Um, yeah, it's an MPEG-4 video. It's encoded in H.264, and uh, it's not a standard file format. So uh, I think he was using a high-end uh, video program called Avid. Um, it doesn't export in the format that you need to uh, pull into this iPod video. Um, there's a couple options that you have for uh, a Mac, and those are you have QuickTime Pro, which um, um, you already have QuickTime installed by default if you have a Macintosh computer. Um, if you don't uh, want to uh, pick up uh, QuickTime Pro, there's this other application here. It's called FFmpegX. Um, it's uh, actually used to be a, a Unix Linux tool. It's been ported over to uh, um, so the Apple OS X operating system. And it's a uh, free download. Uh, it's fairly easy to use. Uh, you download it, you tell it which file you want to pick up, where you want to output it to, and what file type. And uh, in this case, you want to put it for an iPod video uh, MP4 file. Um, very easy to use. It's free. Or it's, uh, you can donate for $15, uh, but it is a, uh, a free you know, shareware type piece of software. Uh, for those folks that are using uh, Windows to uh, sync up with their iPod video, uh, again, you can use QuickTime Pro, which uh, you can download and you can purchase for about 30 bucks. Um, I think it's highly worth it because uh, it's the standard. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, the, it's Apple software for an Apple iPod. And it's probably the best option because it is a Mac product and you're using iTunes, which is obviously an Apple piece of software, mm -hmm. and you know, just using the next step. I mean, that's yeah. what it's designed for. But again, it's thirty bucks. Thirty which... bucks. Um, there's also some other uh, pieces of software. Let me just pull those up um, on the Windows machine. Uh, ones from uh, the same guys that do uh, uh, what's it? Uh, what's the burning software? Neo. Oh, Nero. 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 That's yeah. what it is. Um, they also have a software for converting uh, files. It's called Nero Recode Two. Um, it's their second edition, obviously. It, uh, it'll encode files for burning to DVD, if so you want to do that. But one of the options is to uh, export a file uh, for the iPod video. Again, in that same uh, H.2, uh, man, I can't even remember what it is. H.264. Uh, 264, <laughs> that's what it is. H.264 file format. Um, so, uh, again, this is another piece of software that caught, well, you'll have to purchase. Um, Free programs for um, the uh, Windows uh, Windows users. There's a. It's kind of complicated. What you actually end up doing is uh, decrypting it with a, D a DVD decryptor and re-encoding it. Um, it's actually uh, quite hard to do. Um, I've always ended up opting to use one of the off-the-shelf programs. A lot of times they have demos that you can download. Yeah. Uh, I know even for the Nero software, you can go ahead and download a free demo. So uh, if you don't want to just throw out the money to go pick up one of these pieces of software, you can play the demo game and pick up a couple demos and try that out. And so. because it's a pretty new piece of hardware, they're only going to become more and more popular. You're going to have more and more free tools out there. And more software so. that will just export video to, uh, yeah. to the iPod. So, um, But that's a cool feature of the iPod. I mean, you can actually put... The video you film yourself 
you know, of your kids or whatever it is right. onto your iPod, show it to people. You can put pictures on there. I know I take a ton of digital pictures, and none of them ever get seen by anybody, you right. know. But now I can put them on my iPod. It's hard for some people to see them. My, my dad has a hell of a time. My grandmother can't even do it. So, But it's still very cool. You know, I can show pictures to people of, you know, vacation, stuff like that. Um, you know, you can put all kinds of stuff on it. So Yeah, so for cool. those that are wondering, the file form that you need in order to pop that onto your iPod video is H.264. It's a .mp4 file, but not, uh, but a very specific one, and yeah. that'll work for you. And it bumps down the resolution, too, obviously. Yeah, and it's reducing that resolution, say, if you have a DVD or a DV video that you're recording at home, it bumps it down to 320 wide by 224, 240, 240, 240 I think. something like that. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's what it's doing. It's just reducing the size and also uh, uh, encoding it so that the audio and everything will work fine. Yeah, and that was Emmett's problem. Avid pumps out in... What it says is an iPod format, but really all it's doing is reducing the resolution. To that compatible resolution yeah. size, right. But of course, iPods and Apple have to have some sort of control over the material. So they want it in their specific format. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the downsides that we've talked about a lot with the iPods, but, you know. Yeah, if you get it working right, you know, especially yeah. using one of these pieces of software, it works actually really well. Yeah, and if you're really going to use it like Emmett is, it's probably worth the 30 bucks. Yeah. Definitely, so. definitely. All right, well, uh, moving on. So I'm going to switch it back to you, Dan. Yeah. Um, we've got, uh, today we're going to be talking about how the Internet works, uh, if I can get this thing to work. Um, one more. One more. Nope. There we go. Um, I mean, most of what we're talking about has to do with the Internet. I mean, yeah. Every show either has a web page that we're showing you, we're either talking about a device that plugs into the network or that uses Wi-Fi. Um, Voice over IP, all of that kind of stuff. It's all working over the same system. Yeah, and, and it, not a lot of people know exactly how it all kind of goes together. Yeah, and I think we should probably start out by talking about a traditional telephone system in your house. Sure. And a traditional switch telephone system is actually switched. So if I'm calling my sister on a hardline phone and she's in, um, you know, traditionally, and she's in London, there would actually be a we would be talking over a copper line that runs from my house to London. Mm-hmm. And it's going around through different places, and you see it in a, you know, what they used to have an operator actually plug a line in from a big box. You'd take your signal, plug it into the next one, and switch it over. And that's the way a telephone system traditionally works. And for the millions and millions of people on the Internet doing all kinds of stuff, obviously that's not going to work. Right. You know, going to a website and having a hard line actually going to the website would just never work. So they've changed it up a little bit, and the way they do it now is they use packets. Right. And this is where it gets a little confusing even to me. But when I send, say we're sending an email, that email gets broken up by the computer, by the network card, into small packets. And, I mean, people have described them as little envelopes inside of envelopes and There's all kinds of stuff that goes into this that we won't really get too deep into. But that packet, you know, those 100 packets that might be created by my email get sent off to the next step on the line. Individually, not in a steady stream, not, uh, you know, each each packet goes out by itself and may even travel a different route. Different route, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, So that's basically the starting point. That's the same way it works over your network, well, a similar way. It works over an internal network in your house. But once that stuff gets start, starts going, it gets sent out, and it's all with you know, an email. It's all verified to make sure that everything gets there. Mm-hmm. And like Joe said, it might travel over a different route. And if we could get in on here, we can see here I'm actually doing a little command in Windows, a trace route of techpoints.com. And I know you guys aren't going to be able to see this very well. But if you type in a command prompt, trace RT, whoops, I lost it. Trace RT, you get this trace route. And here we can actually see it sends out one packet from my computer to techpoints.com. And you can see it goes, and actually I should start, techpoints.com is hosted on a computer in Southfield. Correct. But this goes through a bunch of hops, and we can see down here that it's actually going to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And these might be in Michigan, might be in Illinois, but it's definitely going to Chicago and then back to Southfield. And it's taking, 
you know, a few hundred milliseconds right. to make that trip. Um, so anything that's going to tech points or coming from tech points. So if you're looking for a website, you're going to send a few packets out. It's going to send a bunch of packets back. It's going to bring up your website. And that's where it differs from a traditional switched phone network. Um, and it really, <coughs> excuse me, really creates an amazing system because if I'm sending an email to somebody in Australia, you know, it's going to take tons of hops and it might be routed through Hawaii right. or Africa mm -hmm. or it might go both ways. Half the packets might go through Hawaii, half of them might go through Australia. They meet back together, reassemble, reassemble, and it displays the message. Yeah. And every internet request works the same way. Even with yeah. a uh, voice over IP call, we're still dealing with packets. Everything's chopped, chopped down into little, small, easy to manage pieces, um, and that helps with, uh, you know, if there's any trouble in the network, can, these packets can find a different path. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I mean, it works with uh, anytime you're downloading a file, that big, huge file that you're downloading, it's actually downloading a little teeny <laughs> tiny chunk every single time. And thousands of them when you're downloading a song. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And. Um, it helps with fault tolerance of uh, the internet. That's why it's, uh, it's that's why the internet is fairly reliable because if it can't find a route through its fastest possible route, it'll you know it can hop. I mean, in this in this case, example, we were hopping through Chicago, which is pretty interesting to get all the way back to Southfield. But if there was some sort of problem with that route that that one packet took, it that packet may hop over to Pennsylvania and then yeah. come all the way back. So it's uh, it it's, uh, it's, it kind of corrects itself and it uh, and it's uh, and, very reliable system. Yeah, and that's one of the things that makes voice over IP actually a little bit um, not as clear as a regular switch mm -hmm. phone system. Because it's live, if it doesn't receive one of the packets, it just drops it. It forgets all about it. Whereas an email, it needs to have all of those packets. But the voice over IP, what's actually making it sound scratchy is the fact that one of those packets doesn't make it through. It In doesn't time. care. In time. Yeah. It doesn't care. It doesn't display it later you know, display it or sound, it just drops it all together. Mm -hmm. But, you know, makes it very fast. And, I mean, you're talking hundreds of milliseconds to get across the world. And we've actually seen that with our, we have a Vonage line at our office. And uh, it, we try to use a fax machine to send faxes through. doesn't work. Um, fax machine traditionally uses analog so it's using uh, so you know it works on a traditional phone system yeah. when you put that same signal through a digital line what that what that our bondage line does it actually breaks it up into little packets sends it through the internet some of those packets if they don't make it to the other side it cannot render that page it just yeah. cannot it, it just doesn't it won't it won't even render that fax the because the fax machine doesn't understand it right because it needs all the information, and with uh, with a traditional phone system, with a copper line, a direct connection, it can it, all that information is getting through at all times. With the digital system, there, you know, it's figuring I can drop some of these packets, you'll still understand. But for fax, it doesn't. Yeah. So that's that's a good example of uh, how it doesn't work for everything. For everything, yep. Um, now, as far as the actual internet, I think people have a misunderstanding. I mean, you talk about the internet and the World Wide Web are actually two different things. The Internet, according to Wikipedia, which we've talked about quite a bit, um, is a worldwide publicly accessible network of interconnected computer networks that transmit data by packet switching, user standard, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, so the Internet is actually the network of computers, mm -hmm. whereas the World Wide Web, according to Wikipedia, is a global read-write information space. And those are the pages and other things the like that. The emails that you're sending back and forth. Mm -hmm. But some of the stuff that's on the Internet isn't technically on the World Wide Web. Correct. And most of what makes the World Wide Web work is not on the World Wide Web. It's not visible, right? Yeah. And it's that interconnected network of networks. I mean, you have routers like we've showed on the show quite a bit. You get these small routers that we have in our homes, well, an internet service provider is going to have those on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have one WAN port, you know, one outside port on my router, a router in the internet space is going to have, you know, 40 of them. And it's going to be able to send packets wherever it wants to go, which brings us to these internet service providers. 
or ISPs. And that's really <clears throat> where the internet starts to, you know, build upon itself. You know, we have Comcast at my house. The guys here at the War Memorial use Ameritech. Um, and those are just the local internet service providers. Now, Ameritech also happens to be a tier one provider, or this trunk provider, but we're really getting our access to the internet. You know, I'm getting it through Comcast, and Comcast is up there getting into tier one and tier two, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But those are those different networks, right? So yeah. you've got a Comcast network, you've got an Ameritech network, we've got a level three network, you've got another net, uh, you know, Pac Bell network out in the West Coast. Yeah. So we've got, you know, different networks. And by them communicating with each other, we have the Internet. Yeah, and if we go back to our trace route here, we'll see that in Chicago, we bump from SBCGlobal.net network to a Chicago Level 3 network. And there you are, your hopping networks. Yep. And that's where every one of these hops is actually a router um, switching our packets or our packet that we've sent out over and over again until it jumps to, to a what? different to tier one provider. Right. And there's quite a few of these Tier 1 providers out there. And that's sort of, we talked about on another show, with the uh, tiered Internet. Mm -hmm. You know, people are talking about doing a tiered Internet. Well, that's where you get these top tier, these Tier 1 providers providing these massive trunks across the country of fiber optic. And, I mean, they really have a lot invested in it. And, I mean, not just around the country, but around the world. We were talking just a little while ago about how there's, you know, fiber optic underneath every ocean, run into every continent, every country, you know, and that's really where the internet gets its. I mean, they call it the backbone. You know, it's the backbone of the internet. It's where everything that goes through the internet passes through, no matter where you are in the world. Anybody can access anything because of this massive network of packet switching. Mm. So yeah. for those. Uh I mean, for most people at home, what they're doing is what? I mean, most, most people are sending email, Looking maybe up. doing some chatting, um, hitting websites. Um, for the typical user, you're typing in uh, a, a domain name. Yeah. So, you know, you're typing in techpoints.com. Um, what that's doing is actually really by typing in that web address, you're not getting directly to the machine. Um, there's some translation that goes on because in the Internet, the way everything works, everything's <coughs> identified not by the name, and you can use that domain name and... and and more, and, I mean, there's much longer domains and host names and things, but you can use the words, but really the way that the final, uh, the packets get transferred are really based on IP address. And those are a series of numbers um, that um, are a, a, a unique number for that device. Um, for example, uh, the TechPoints website has a unique number. Anywhere in the Internet, if you type in this unique number, you'll get directly to that machine. Um, you're given a, uh, if you have an internet service provider, if you type in on, your, on the outside of your connection, you have a unique number. So every house on your block most likely has a unique number that's directly to that house or directly to that uh, machine. Yeah. So if you're at home, you type in a web address, what it actually does is it actually goes out to what's called a domain name server. And what that does is you type in techpoints.com. It says, your computer says, okay, what's... What's the IP address I need to hit? What's that unique number I need to get to in order to show up this dis display this page? The unique the, the domain name's typed in, you hit enter, it goes out to the domain name server that keeps a long list of these IP numbers and domain names. And it goes through that list and finds the correct domain name, it matches it with an IP address, and now your computer knows how to get to that website or to that machine. Um, it happens instantaneously, milliseconds. And so it's not, uh, it's not something that's going to take a lot of time. And this is, what, this is what goes on all the time, all the time. And it's what makes the Internet useful to people every day. Correct. I mean, there's no way that I'm going to remember to go to, if I want to go to techpoints.com, instead of typing techpoints.com, I've got to type 69, 39, 66, 71. Every single time, yeah. yeah. It's not... And you can see it up here, it's 66.39. Or 69.39.66.71. Yeah, that's that unique and, address. And but uh, but what your computer did here is it actually went through. It went to it. Uh, we said we wanted to trace for techpoints.com. It automatically the first thing it did was resolve that that IP address. Yeah. It found the the unique number. And that I mean it's that makes the internet useful. Mm -hmm. You know, and that it, the DNS servers what there's a I know there's a the World Wide Web Consortium hosts the 
top tier, top tier. Mm -hmm. DNS servers. Are there 13 worldwide or something like I'm that? I'm not sure, but it's broken down mostly by, I mean, when you type in a .com address, you're searching one group of DNS servers. If you yeah. type a .net address, it's searching a different group, and on and on and on and on like that. Yeah, and you'll see this. You're, you know, Comcast or Ameritech or somebody else has their own DNS servers, which are constantly out there looking at these higher tier DNS servers to see, do I have the right lists? Do I, you know... Am I going to the right places? Yeah, and, and very rarely do are there mistakes. And it's and it's actually a pretty it's a it's a constant process of updating yeah. these names and numbers, and it goes on. It happens I think four times a day if that's still accurate, yeah. and uh, it's a continual process. So when something gets changed, um, the idea is that after a certain amount of time, everybody will go out and look for that update. Um, you know, at least for my, our machines at uh, the service that we, we host, that's what they're doing. Every four, four times a day, it's going out and checking, okay, do I have the, the most accurate uh, list of numbers and names? Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing the way that all this stuff works together. Um, and it's also pretty safe from, uh, um, from going down because it, it, there's always a failover. If, it can't, yeah. if I can't resolve it here on my machine, it may, it'll check a secondary server and um, you know, if it can't get to that server using one route, it'll try another way. Yeah. yeah. And all this kind of stuff you might not even see on your normal computer because if you have a router in your house, your router is doing all of it for it's you. It's doing all the work, correct. So, um, but it's a very interesting concept. I mean, even in your house internally, you get an IP address from your router if you have a router. If not, you're getting that public IP address that Joe talked about before. You're getting that so your computer is right on the internet just as a Google server is and if not your router is and you actually get a private IP address which we won't get a lot into inside which I'm sure you guys have seen a 192, 168 something private IP address. But they're actually starting to run out of the public IP addresses. Yeah, yeah and that's, uh, that's a big concern. It's, uh... As more devices, as more people get uh, broadband to their homes, as more uh, devices get placed on the Internet, more web servers, um, these numbers, I mean, we only have so many of the numbers, so um, they yeah. start to run out. Um, we haven't run out yet, and, um, but, uh, yeah, slowly you're going to see more and more use of what's called private IP addressing. So instead of you getting at your home a, lo an, a, a public IP, an IP that's uh, a unique address on the web, you might actually get an IP address that's... Uh, that's just, uh, um, you might share a, a unique IP. Yeah. And actually in uh, the web hosting, uh, for a lot of websites that are hosted, more, it used to be where every website would have its own unique number. Now more and more, um, you'll have thousands of websites sharing one single IP address where the web server figures out if you asked for that number, which, which website was it that you wanted to go to. Um, it used to be that all, like 2,000 of those websites would have a unique number. Now it's one IP address for all 2,000 websites. Yeah. And, I mean, there, were, there was a lot of talk a few years ago about going over, we're using um, Internet Protocol v4, version 4, and they were talking about going over to version 6. But, like you said, I mean, you don't, with a lot of the new technologies, you really don't need that many more IPs. I mean, we're starting to get, you know, in the past, before we came out with these little home routers that use a technology called NAT or network address translation, you used to have to have, if you had four computers in your house, every one of them would have to have a public IP address. Now I can have one public IP address from Comcast, <clears throat> and I can essentially hook up, what, 254, 253 computers mm -hmm in my house hooked up to that same router and I mean the router that most people have in their houses right now you can just daisy chain switches together or have them all wireless hook up all those computers and you're really eliminating the need for changing anything mm -hmm. I think um, you know I mean we see some web hosting companies that are actually using NAT yeah, inside exactly. as opposed to just using you know a username underneath that IP so that each Server inside their uh, case is getting a public or a private IP address, so it's really you know with the way switching is changing, you know this packet switching, it's really I mean it's really blowing up the internet, and you're going to see a lot more devices on there, and the ability to have a lot more inside your own homes. Right, and then you, I mean we have we have cell phones that are on the internet. I know yeah. my cell phone can get out to the web that has a its own unique address. 
and uh, the, all those devices are really changing the way uh, the addressing will work in the future. Yeah. yeah. And as we're finding out, I mean, uh, Kermit was telling us that AT&T is talking about putting fiber to the curb, mm-hmm. bringing in everything, essentially your cable, your telephone, everything through the Internet, you know, through this network of computers, using fiber directly into people's houses, and instead of getting your cable through an actual cable line, you're going to get it through the same line that you get everything else yeah. and a, a lot faster. Yeah. For those that are interested in more about this stuff, I mean, right, there's a lot more in-depth information that we can go into about yeah. how the Internet works, um, you know, how internal networks or LAN networks or your home network works. Um, there's a podcast that Dan and I both really like. Uh, we listen to it uh, every, I mean, every week it comes out with a new podcast. Yeah. It's really great. It's called Security Now. Um, it, it deals with a lot of security issues, but three of the best episodes that they have are uh, uh, two episodes on how the world works. The Internet or, works. Sorry, world. <laughs> internet works. For me, it's... They, if yeah, they could explain... We can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how the Internet works. So that's two episodes. They're great episodes. Um, and then the third episode was about how local area networks work which is uh, your home network, your office network. Yeah. Um, so I'll put some links to those episodes on techpoints.com. Uh, but if you have an iPod or you have iTunes loaded on your computer, uh, I'd recommend subscribing to, uh, to the Security Now podcast. And, it's, uh, and it's, it goes, it, it's about an hour long. It goes in depth. It's two sessions on that, how the Internet works. So we're just brushing on the surface here. Just a little bit of information we can provide. But I think uh, if you're interested in it, it'll be a great resource for you. Yeah, and it is really interesting. I mean, it's just amazing to think about how these computers, I mean, these massive networks of computers are talking with each other yeah. and constantly. And one of these days we're actually, I think, going to try to do a remote from our data center and show you what the computer that a website is hosted on looks like. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's weird to think of, you know, you go to techpoints.com, well, where, what is that? Where is techpoints.com? Where is google.com? And I try to explain it to, you know, my folks or my grandmother, just it boggles her mind. And if you can actually see it, I think it helps a little bit better. So we'll get out there one of these days soon. But Yeah, and actually on this episode, we'll put some pictures from that. From the data center. Yeah, so you can get a better idea what yeah. that looks like. My favorite place to work. It's a consistent, like, 65 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. None of these hot lights. <laughs> we'll have more information about, uh, about what we talked about. I'll put those links uh, to those shows, which I highly recommend you watch yeah. if you're interested at all in how this works. Um, of course, if you have any questions, you can always email us at techpoints at gmail.com. Um, or check us out on the web at techpoints.com. Right, right. Um, so I'm Joe. And I'm Dan. And this is Tech Points. Thank you.